You could call me a poet, but that's not all I am. I'll sing you a song with a big bad band. I'll give you brain tingles and twitchy fingers while the questions bloom out my mouth. I'll teach while I learn about this lion city where I come from. It's always new to me. Do you know there's over 50 museums in Singapore? Museums are a great way to see, touch and experience cool and interesting things about a place. We're going on the path less traveled to some quirky and unusual museums in this city state. From a specimen that's swept up on Singapore shores, it's time to inspect some stingray. To a magical musical box. The Titanic. Yes. To a beloved Singapore mascot. Yes, that courtesy lion. We find out how each museum's curations are ultimately an expression of our unique Singapore identity. Pop quiz hotshot, where is the world's largest camera-shaped building? It's right here in Singapore. And it houses more than 1,000 vintage cameras. Lights, action, camera. The Vintage Camera Museum is the first and only of its kind here in Singapore. It's a private museum, opened in 2017 and owned by S. Ramanathan and his cousin A.P. Shritha. The museum displays hundreds of cameras from their personal collections. They had one mission, to collect every type of camera invented. In this quest, they roped in family and friends, searched the internet, enlisted the help of dealers, and visited auction houses all around the world. That's why we put in so much effort to design. When you see right from the building to the exhibits, everything is related to camera. As a collector, you know, you hardly use all the cameras. Mainly it's for a hobby, I want to collect it. And what's the centerpiece of the museum? Centerpiece is the world's biggest and world's smallest camera. These are some of the most attractive and unique pieces. This is the world's biggest ever camera made to capture a complete train in a single shot. They spent about $7,500 during late 1800. You need about 15 people to operate this camera at a single time. And all these were made just to take one single photo. It looks like a pocket watch, right? Mm -hmm. But it is a spy camera. You can see a lens hole here. Normal pocket watch and still shoot it whenever they want it. Ah. But my favourite exhibit has got to be the pigeon camera. Not many of these were made in the 1900s and there are only a few pieces left in the world today. There's one particular piece that catches my eye. Julius Neuburner, a German guy who was a pharmacist, he used pigeons to deliver urgent medication to the nearby post. He wanted to know where these pigeons go around, so he designed a camera, which is about 70 gram weight. There will be a timer to delay a shot. It will take one panoramic shot. The timer release the button, and then it will go one panoramic shot. That's why this particular picture is so famous. These are some of the other aerial shots taken using pigeon photography. These are world's first drone. What makes this museum a Singapore museum? If you see Singapore, it's a small country with a lot of uh, diversification. The same way, even though we are small, we have a lot of uh, varieties put together. Yeah, you feel like it's representative of the mishmash of the country. A uh, Kind of, yes, you are right. Also in the same building is a space filled with artwork by A.P. Shritha, the museum's co-founder. This camera museum is full of history and information, just like Ram. I've really learned a lot today about the evolution of cameras and gotten an education through the lens. It's really taught me a lot. Once upon a time in Singapore, there was a national courtesy campaign. Can you believe we need to be taught to be kind or that there's a kindness gallery in Singapore? Do you remember Singer the Lion? Yes, that courtesy lion, the one from social studies. Well, he's got a new lease of life at the kindness gallery. Let's go say hi. 
The National Courtesy Campaign was launched in 1979. There were contests to find the most courteous driver, there was a photo competition to capture public acts of courtesy, and there were slogans like, Courtesy begins with me. The campaign became part of public life, but its most recognisable face, Singer, was introduced in 1982. Now, after more than two decades, this campaign has been replaced by the Singapore Kindness Movement, with a permanent home in this gallery, where old memorabilia greet visitors. The Kindness Movement is actually the successor to the National Courtesy Campaign. People thought it would be better if there was a real movement, not a campaign only, which would then involve more people and engage them more. The Kindness Gallery also runs a tour for preschoolers. Its aim, to teach children what kindness means and how they can be considerate in small ways. Children keep signing up for our Kindsville uh, letters as well as our Kindsville party. That is something which is fulfilling to know that there are children who really like what we do to the extent that they will participate with us year after year. How do you feel about what we did today? Grateful. I get to join the tour and I get to do a lot of things. Will you tell me what you learned today? Kindness. Kindness means share, love, and helping. But the kindness movement is not just for kids. In true blue Singaporean style, the team came up with a food-related movement to bring a little cheer and inclusivity to different groups. It's called Just an Extra Chair. So Just an Extra Chair was conceived in 2016. We asked hosts to sign up and offer up an extra chair at their Chinese New Year table. It's opened up to people who want to visit this host. Then they celebrate the festival together. We think it has substantial potential for creating this sort of meaningful relationships and exchange of values and culture. The movement has evolved to include other festivities all year round. So I didn't expect it, but I've had a lot of really good feelings today. I even feel quite inspired. I guess a place like this can inspire kindness in other people. It did for me. It survived. Yes. I'm excited. Come, let's take a look. Maybe you've seen musical boxes like this, but can you imagine what they looked like a century ago? I'm going to take you to a really special museum full of fantastical pieces. The Musical Box Museum is the first of its kind in Singapore. Most of the display pieces are from the founder Naoto Urui's personal collection. In the 80s, Naoto fell in love with antique pieces that he chanced upon in Geneva. Then, he became a musical box collector. At 29, he learnt how to repair musical boxes under the mentorship of Graham Webb, who wrote the first guidebook for musical box collectors. He showed Naoto five musical boxes from his collection that were produced in Singapore in the 1860s. Naoto made a promise to him to bring one of them back to its place of origin. With this, he decided to open Singapore's first ever musical box museum. This space is very heavy metal because to touch to the box tighty, uh, maybe old Singaporeans don't have an idea to using screw. Ah, uh, so this was an early idea of how to make a musical really, box. Really is that one. And every part is hand-cut hand And each one is a different dimension, and uh, it's really unusual things. This musical box, called the Atlantic, contains instruments like a piano, 
a bass drum and cymbals. It's a band in a box. This Atlantic is ordered by the French Line. The French Line is a passenger boat company in France. They order the Gusta company to make this one for Titanic board. The Titanic? Yes, the one. So they decided this one operated by only gold coin. So then they decided don't put in Titanic, put in the Normandy. That's why this machine is staying here. It survived. Yes. In 1886, a German musical box maker, Paul Lochmann, developed a piece that used a punched disc, which revolutionized the industry as discs could be mass produced. Uh, this box has a very big gear here. Behind the gear, you can see spring. This spring is I rolling like this, and then give the power, and this is a power source for the machine. And also, just next to the gear, you can see there's something like this is speed controller. And then inside, you can see the disc. So what's that and called? This is just like a comb for hair. And we say the comb with the teeth. These teeth have a, each one is a, each different sound. Each tooth represented a musical note. The more teeth it had, the more musical notes could be played and the longer the song became. So who is this? Oh, this one I call Sleeping Beauty because uh, only high key uh, she can sing in. This Sleeping Beauty is from the Raffles Hotel. Initially thought to be a broken clock, it was later revealed to be a musical box around the same age as the 132-year-old Grand Dame. But Naoto's all-time favorite item is the cheapest exhibit at the museum. He was charged only £10 for it at a Sunday market in England because the original owners thought it was broken. And then I bring back to this one to my workshop. But when I pick up movement, something is falling down. Then the music is stopped. I'm very surprised. So this one is a Victorian period original ring. The box did not work because the ring had jammed the sound mechanism. Naoto tried to return both the ring and the musical box to the sellers, but they declined, deciding to honor the initial deal. I really wanted to keep this museum forever because this is very important for this country. The important thing is more people come and more people have a time to come to listen to our story, our music. The sounds of these musical boxes, they've resonated in my soul. They gave me goosebumps. This was a really special museum for me. I'm gonna be coming back again. Now we go from the not so modern to the ancient past. The Li Kong Chen Natural History Museum is the first and only natural history museum in Singapore. It's also the first natural history museum in the whole of Southeast Asia. This museum gives us a glimpse into the history of life on Earth, from the massive to the microscopic, from the weird to the wonderful. It is home to more than 500,000 plant and animal species from Southeast Asia. Let's have a look. The Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum opened its doors in 2015. The star attractions are three diplodocid sauropod skeletons discovered in Wyoming, USA. About 80% of each skeleton was complete, making them some of the most intact fossils ever found. Closer to home, there is also a real specimen of the extinct leatherback sea turtle, the largest in the world, which was caught in Siglap in 1883. The museum's um, important for the history of Singapore because it's, it's the heritage, you know, it's your natural heritage. It's specimens of species that have been here or still live here. People think of um, natural history as just being animals and boring science stuff, but it's, it's your environment. So it's important to look at, you know, where we've been, what we've come through. 
Singaporeans love their food. There's a lot of stuff here. How much is actually on display? Uh, on display, there's about 4,000 specimens. There's less than 1% of the collection. Wow, so there's a lot of stuff in storage. Yeah, and being researched as well. Yeah, used in the collections by the curators, scientists coming in. Curator Huang Wei Song gave us access to the dry collection, which is not open to the public. So here, this is our insect collection. Yeah. Right, all across this compactus. Right here, we have the stick insect collection, which I'm going to show you real quick. I'm excited. Come, let's take a look. Here we have the uh, stick insect collection. So in Southeast Asia, we have one of the largest stick insects in the world. <laughs> right, and these guys are quite massive in themselves. Right, so they're so big that you cannot really put them up. So here we have the Asian barbets, and they are very abundant in Southeast Asia. I'll show you one of these drawers. Take a look at the colours. Wow, they're so beautiful. The Asian barbets are a diverse group of mainly forest-dwelling birds. They play an important role in seed dispersal in Southeast Asia's forests. Yeah, so barbets, they are very, very shy. They are only found in very good, pristine forests. They don't venture out. This is actually collected from Pulau Ubin. Specimens in the wet collection require handling of a different kind. They are kept in a liquid medium of about 75% ethanol. It's time to inspect some stingray. Here we have some non-natives to Singapore. Okay, uh, it's a recent introduction. It's from South America originally. It's called the Motoro Stingray. It's rather attractive, and what's dangerous about it, it's not because it's good at sambal, but <laughs> it's spine. Okay, you can see here, the spine is still intact, and it's venomous. Besides stingrays, the wet collection has a variety of vertebrates and invertebrates, many of which were found in Singapore waters, like the banded coral snake and the cicerid catfish. So Kate, do you think there's a fact about this museum that should be more widely known? Yeah, that it exists. A lot of people don't know. I mean, if I tell people where I work, they, they don't know it's here. I'm... Now you know. <laughs> so many of these animals I didn't even know existed. I've learned so much about the history of Singapore's nature today. It's been awesome. So you've really seen the coast cycle grow from a seed into a tree. Fancy a glimpse into the future? There's a museum in Singapore that lets you do just that. Imagine a huggable lamp or a state-of-the-art credit card wallet. Just some of the designs at this place that you can expect. We thought Design Museum is the physical embodiment of an international design award, the Redot Design Award. Its origins can be traced back to 1955 in Essen, Germany. And back then, the Germans already have a tradition of giving out awards for good design for products. And what you see here in Singapore, Red Dot Design Museum Singapore is the second museum in the world. We have over 200 uh, design works. Uh, they have gotten a Red Dot Design Award displaying good design. What's the most Singaporean thing about the Red Dot Design Museum? You'll be able to find design objects, uh, fashion accessories that is designed by Singapore designers at the museum shop as well. Within the exhibitions, you will be able to find a handful of design works that were submitted from Singapore. They've gotten an award and it's exhibited here in the museum. Every year, we have about a handful of uh, products, uh, ideas, concepts that were submitted from Singapore. We're looking at about 4,000 over entries uh, each year and four or five emerged as works that were submitted from Singapore. Currently on display, we actually have a bicycle that is produced by Co-Cycle and this is, these are Singapore designers. 
And what's so interesting about this actual exhibit is that products grow from a concept all the way to an actual product. Oh, so you've really seen the coast cycle grow from a seed into a tree. Yes. That's really meaningful. Queen actually solves a couple of problems uh, that we see locally, like uh, the need to have a compact uh, bicycle that can fit into the, our HDB list. The original concept of the, of the bike was for urban type city environment where you have to carry a laptop bag to go to work. So that's where the center cargo compartment comes from. The ergonomically designed cargo cage can store laptops or bags and its location in the centre ensures perfect balance for the rider. The whole concept of the bike is that we try to make it as little maintenance as possible, you never think about it. The belt drive is completely silent and doesn't leave any marks on my clothing. Well, the other major features is it has internal gear hubs. Everything is inside, it's waterproof, it's sealed. It lasts for 10 years. With all these design elements in mind, one of these babies will set you back at least 1,400 US dollars. I always thought that museums only collected the past, but the Red Dot Design Museum has shown me that it's possible to collect the future. And you know what? The future is very beautiful. <laughs> this episode, I saw that museums really do matter for both local and foreign people in search of discovery. For Singaporeans, museums are a gift box of information, full of treasure, a life-size encyclopedia just a train ride away. For tourists, museums are just so much better than a guidebook. They're where the past and the future live, where we learn about a country and its people. Every time I go to a new place, there are always two things I check out, the library and the museum. I'm geeky like that. I love stories. I'd never been to any of these museums until now, but they've really given me a new perspective on Singapore.